the hospital on fire. I was instructed to post a man as lookouts in the hospital at the most vulnerable points and to take out and command a line of skirmishers. Shortly after 3.30, an officer commanding a troop of Natal light horse arrived, having gotten away from East San Luana, and asked Lieutenant Chard for instructions. He was ordered to send detachments to observe the drift in pontoons and to plate at place outposts in the direction of the enemy to check his advance. About 4.15, the sound of firing was heard on the hill behind our front. The officer returned and reported the enemy close upon us. He also reported that his hundred men would not obey orders and had ridden off. About the same time, another detachment of 100 men belonging to the Natal native contingent bolted, including their officer himself. I'm glad to say he was brought back some days later, court-martialed and dismissed from the service. The desertion of these detachments of 200 men appeared at first sight to be a great loss, with only a hundred of us left. But the feeling was that we could not have trusted them, and also that our defences were too small to accommodate them anyhow. We knew now that whatever might happen, we had to fight it out alone, and about 4.30 the enemy, from five to 600 strong, came in sight round the hill to our south, and driving my thin red line of skirmishers, made a rush at our south wall. They were met and held by a steady and deliberate fire for a short time. Then, being reinforced by some hundreds, they made desperate and repeated attempts to break through our temporary defences, but were repulsed time and again. To show their fearlessness and their contempt for the redcoats and small numbers, they tried to leap the parapet, and at times seized our bayonets, only to be shot down. Looking back, one could not but admire their fanatical bravery. About seven o'clock they succeeded, after many attempts, in setting fire to the hospital. The small number we were able to despair defended it room by room, bringing out all the sick who could be moved before they retired. Privates Hook, R. Jones, W. Jones and J. Williams were the last to leave, holding the door with the bayonet when all their ammunition was expended. The Victoria Cross was awarded to these men, and they fully deserved it. The Zulus had collected the rifles from the men whom they had killed at Isanawana, and had captured the ammunition from the mules which had stampeded and threw their loads. So our own arms were being used against us. In fact, this was the cause of every one of our casualties killed and wounded, and we should have suffered many more if the enemy had known how to use a rifle. There was hardly a man even wounded by an assegai, their principal weapon. The attack lasted from 4.30pm on the 22nd to 4am on the 23rd, twelve exciting hours, and when daybreak occurred the enemy was out of sight. About seven o'clock they appeared again to the southwest, but help was at hand. Lord Chelmsford, with the other half of his original force, was only an hour's march away. On the previous afternoon, he had learned of the destruction of his camp at Isandalwana. A certain Commandant Lonsdale had chanced to ride back to the camp, and had been fired at by Zulus wearing our men's uniform. He escaped by a miracle, and was able to report the news to Lord Chelmsford. Lord Chelmsford at once addressed his men and said, Whilst we were skirmishing ahead, the Zulus have taken our camp. There must be 10,000 in our rear, and 20,000 in front. We must win back our camp tonight, and cut our way back to Rourke's Drift tomorrow. All right, sir, we'll do it. They got back to camp that night, but they found a grim and silent scene as they cautiously approached. The next day they resumed their march and appeared at Rourke's Drift, and our enemy retired. In his dispatch afterwards, Lord Chelmsford said, to our intense relief, the waving of hats was seen from the hastily erected entrenchments, and the information soon reached me that the garrison had, for twelve hours, made the most gallant resistance I have ever heard of against the determined attack of some three thousand Zulus, three hundred and fifty of whose dead bodies surrounded the post. Our losses were seventeen killed and nine wounded. There's three hundred and fifty-one killed that we buried. Their wounded must have been four to five hundred, which they removed under the cover of night. There are two things which I think have made Rourke's Drift stand out so vividly after all these years. The first, that it took place on the same day as the terrible massacre at Isanawana, and the second, that Natal was saved from being overrun by a savage and victorious foe. Seven VCs were awarded to this one company of the regiment, which is now the South Wales Borderers. I have told you the names of four of the men who won the VC. The other three were Lieutenant Bromhead, Corporal Allen and Private F. Hitch. The Victoria Cross was also awarded to Lieutenant Chard, Royal Engineers, 
Surgeon Reynolds and Corporal Sheese, but not one, I regret to say, of those VCs is alive today. In fact, there are only six survivors of Rourke's Drift alive today. Ex-privates W. Cooper, G. Edwards, H. Martin, W. Owens, H. Williams and myself. Lieutenants Chard and Bromhead and the men received the thanks of Parliament, the officers being promoted to the rank of Major. I was awarded the Distinguished Conduct Medal with an annuity of £10, the same awarded to the Victoria Cross, and awarded a commission, but as I was the youngest of eight sons and the family exchequer was empty, I had to refuse it at the time. Now, just one word for the men who fought that night. I was moving amongst them all the time, and not for one moment did they flinch. Their courage and their bravery could not be expressed in words. For me, they were an example of my soldiering days. The following year, Queen Victoria received at Windsor Castle a colour party of the regiment and decorated the Queen's colours with a silver wreath of immortelles in memory of Lieutenants Melville and Coghill for their devotion in trying to save the Queen's colours on the 22nd of January and for the noble defence of Rourke's Drift. So if you ever have the great privilege of seeing the colours of the South Wales border as uncased, you'll see the wreath. The original wreath presented by Her Majesty is now in the regimental chapel of Breton Cathedral. You may have seen the famous picture of Rourke's Drift painted by that great French artist de Neuville, and the original is in the officers' mess of the 2nd Battalion, now at Londonderry.